Coming on to the last uh, contribution to our session, uh, it's from Professor Cornelia Las Fleury from the University of Innsbruck. Yeah. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome here to Basel, and it's a great pleasure for me to give you a short, and very, very short insight on fungal infections. Um, the question was to give uh, you an idea what's going on. So before, before I start, I would bring your attention to what is of crucial for patient care if dealing with uh, infectious diseases. It is crucial to know which pathogen is suffering a patient from. Is it either bacteria, bacteria ubiquitous, and nowadays we know that they are troublesome because of multi-drug resistance, or do we dealing with the virus? Viruses are very interesting because every year, usually every, every year to second year, we have new viruses coming up and disturbing our life. Or are we dealing with the fungus, which uh, you see here, these small particles, these small conidia, which are in the air, there is no air free of fungus, which we inhale, and if, if we do not have macrophages and neutrophils, which uh, kill them, we may suffer from an invasive fungal infection, or if we are dealing with protozoa or with the helminths. So these are the five um, groups a doctor needs to know because the treatment is very, very specific. And for the last, for the protozoa and for the helminths, let's say we do not care that much about because in our regions they are not, um, well, not widely distributed. And how do we usually get um, the identification of a pathogen which is uh, in our body? Well, usually let's start with the clinical presentation. This is um, a CT thorax where you see this very, very small lesion over there here. And maybe the doctor doesn't know, is it cancer or is it something infectious diseases? So, to know whether this is a bacteria or something says we need to stick in the needle and get out a sample from the lung, like here, or it is a little bit easier. Some of you is on holiday in Vietnam or something somewhere coming back with some clinical presentation. You see this lesion here, and also we have to stick in the needle. And then the question is, is it a bacterium? Is it not, a, not really a virus or something else? And then, in the laboratory, we start with the microscopy. And for us, it is quite easy and very fast to discriminate if in the material taken out from the biopsy, if there is a fungus inside, it's quite easy to get a very, very superficial diagnosis. What we see here is a fungus. But we are not able, from the microscopic examination, to give the fungus a name whether this fungus is called Aspergillus or whether this fungus is called Candida or something like this. We need to do some more specific, and this is what in the laboratory nowadays we use. We use uh, culturing the pathogen, and you can see here the most important fungi nowadays are the molds or the yeasts. And now step directly into the fungus, uh, molds and yeasts are ubiquitous. And most of the molds and the yeasts live inside the body and outside the body. And here's the problem number one. Is the fungus we detect in our nose or wherever, is it a pathogen or is it a colonizer? Usually we do not know because it's ubiquitous. We need to have a sample from a sterile body region inside the human body. So this is problem number one. We have a lot of fungi, but only, let's say, in the human being, only 200 species cause severe disease. But we need to know the fungus, and most are Candida, Aspergillus, and Crypto. So what are the trends? To be honest, within bacteria, virus, and fungi, fungi are the most problematic one to get a diagnose and also in treating. So what do we face presently? 
we see an increase in fungal diseases, especially in immunocompromised patients. Fungal infections 10 years ago about in the immunosuppressed patients, let's say ham onco patients, in between five to seven percentage incidence. Nowadays, depending from center to center, in between 20 to 25 percentage. And the problem is that the clinical signs and symptoms are not specific. So the doctor anyway doesn't know suffering from bacteria or fungus, so we need an, adequ an adequate diagnosis. But main of the problem, we do not have really good diagnostics assays available. Nowadays, we use some molecular-based PCR or whatever, but as mentioned before, we try to detect a fungus which is ubiquitous with PCR, which is not that easy because we never know is it pathogenic or is it a colonizer. So most of the patients being suspicious of a fungal infection get the treatment against bacteria, against the fungi, and maybe also against the virus because it's hard to get a diagnosis. What we see nowadays a little bit is not, not, not that much as with a bacteria, but the replacement with uh, resistant one. We use a lot of prophylaxis, which does mean we use a lot of inhalational therapy to get rid of the fungi inhaled. We have uh, mentioned before new hosts, and uh, the outcome highly depends on three factors. The, uh, the underlying disease, the dissemination of the fungus in the human body, is it somewhere from top to the toe or is it localized? And at least on the fungus name, on the species identified. There are species which are more pathogenic than the others. So and this brings me to the major problems. Unresolved, at least I would say we have three, problem, three problems. We do not have an adequate diagnosis. Sticking in the needle and getting a specimen out of the lung or somewhere else is not possible in all patients because of the side effects. Could be bleeding, could be something else. So what we try to do is we use some molecular-based tests, but we have the antibody-based tests, which you can forget, because most of us have in contact with any fungus and, of course, producing an antibody. So an antibody screening test you can forget. What we do is we use antigen tests uh, where we have a closer look to cell wall components, but to be honest, sensitivity and specificity of these tests varies according to the underlying disease, number first, and second, on the burden of the fungus. The higher the burden, the better the outcome, but on the other side, the worse the outcome for the patients. So most of the, most of the SS are also have a very, very long turnaround time, and I would say this is what we really need. Secondly, when we come to the antifungal drugs, nowadays we have three classes of antifungal drugs available, the bolians, the echinocandins, and the azels, and none of them are, let's say, the optimum. They are either toxic or they do not reach the region in the body where we need a higher concentration. So anyway, and the third, um, up to now, we do not have an, any vexation for invasive fungal and pathogens when we compared to bacteria. So I think these are the three major unresolved problems. I'm happy if you have any idea to overcome one of these problems. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this really emerging talk. Um, are there questions from the audience or comments? Please. Thank you for your presentation. Could you comment as to whether or not there's anything known about the microbial diversity that would perhaps point towards more sensitivity to certain kinds of fungal infectivity? Yes, of course. Uh, what we learn now from whole genome sequencing whatsoever is that uh, it seems that a human body carries more fungi than we ever thought about, and diversity is huge, 
but at least presently with culture techniques, we only know some of the Aspergillus and Candida. But we expect that we have, we carry more than probably much more than we know on, on, fungal, on fungal pathogens now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, excellent overview and uh, focusing on problems. But I wonder, I mean, we have today uh, drugs like ambisomes, for example. And I remember in the old days, this was in the 90s, I myself prepared some formulation to treat patients. I treated about 25 patients uh, with different diseases. One of them particularly was infected with fusarium. Yep. And, and all of them were saved from the disease. Many of them died later from the cancer they have. And what, so in a way, uh, this is a, a good way to go. So why, yeah. why not, why you are so pessimistic? I, I, I'm not sure whether I'm so pessimistic. It, it, it is a, a clinical problem we face, but to be honest, amphotericine B and trapped is the liposomal, the liposomal amphotericine B. Well, it is one of the broadest drugs we have available, the broadest drug, which is very good. We can use it for all the fungi, but in the meantime, we have bollion resistant fungi. So no chance to treat. And to be honest, uh, the serum concentrations needed for these rare fungal pathogens we can't reach with embisome, even, or, even it's um, entrapped in, in liposomes. Thank you. OK, so if there are no any questions, I would like to thank, thank all you. the um, referees here for the interesting talk. And especially also for keeping in time. Thank you very much. So the next session is uh, headed by...